Welcome to the Lower Cranial Nerves, 7 through 12, where we'll take a radiographic tour of the lower brainstem, looking at anatomy and pathology. I have a few financial disclosures. I am, have grant funding, and I'm also a consultant for Primal Pictures, and I'll be using those images to highlight that key anatomy throughout my talk. My goal in this lecture is to give you a map, similar to a map of New York City, where we can see all these um, lines where if you want to take the subway or like the cranial nerves, but really the concept of mastery, autonomy, and purpose. So my goal in the time I have with you in this lecture is we're going to look at those major landmarks. You can master them and we're going to take a look at them on both MRI and CT. And we're going to follow the cranial nerves through those landmarks. We're going to focus on that key anatomy of the skull base and those cranial nerves and of course the pathology that can affect them as well. So if we take a look at how the cranial nerves are laid out, similar to New York City, which is divided by that subway lines coming from Grand Central Terminal, you can also take a look at the embryo, which has the neural tube, and it's divided by what's called the sulcus limitans. Now the sulcus limitans is important because all the nerves that are located along the dorsal or dorsal like behind, like a dorsal fin, are gonna be your sensory neurons versus the motor nuclei, which are gonna be located ventral or anterior. And this lays out in the spinal cord. We can see the motor nuclei are located ventral and medial, and our sensory nuclei are located dorsal and lateral. The same laying out is seen with the cranial nerve nuclei. So you, of course you have your sensory nuclei, these are gonna be located dorsal and lateral, and your motor nuclei, which are gonna be located ventral and medial. If we take a look at those spinal tracts, they have that same organization. So your motor and your sensory follow along that same topographic appearance. So you've got your ventral motor and your dorsal sensory. So if we look at the spinal tracts and we start looking at our cranial nerves, we'll start our tour with cranial nerve 7. Now cranial nerve 7 does a lot of different functions. It's responsible for the muscles of facial expression and also importantly for taste and salivation. If we look at cranial nerve 7, as it exits that brainstem, it's protected by that important mastoid tip. It innervates the posterior belly of the digastric. And the easy way to remember this is if you go out eating and use your corda tympani nerve, you're going to put Heinz 57 on your steak sauce. Five is for the anterior belly, seven for the posterior belly. Now that we can see that, we also see it innervates those submandibular and sublingual glands. And it also importantly innervates that corda tympani, anterior two thirds of the tongue. So if we look at the facial nerve, we can see it has four key functions, branchial motor, innervating the stapedius, stylohyoid, posterior belly of the digastric, remember Heinz 57, five anterior, seven posterior, your muscles of facial expression, the buccinator muscle, platysma, and the occipitalis muscle. It has visceral motor. Those are gonna stimulate your lacrimal glands, your submandibular, your sublingual glands, and all of those glandular things throughout the mucous membranes in your nose, hard, and soft palates. You have a little general sensory, which goes to the posterior ear, and you have that special sensory, the corda tympani, which innervates the anterior two-thirds of the tongue for taste. So if we follow that nerve, it exits and it's protected by that mastoid tip. See the nerve exiting out and then it branches into five key branches in the parotid gland. If we look at the nerve as it comes on this coronal CT and axial CT scan, we see that it exits out and then it comes along the anterior superior aspect of the internal artery canal and then it exits through the genu and comes back under the horizontal tympanic portion. So let's follow this in a little bit more detail. This orange dot is the genu. Genu means knee, so it's that first bend, and then it extends backwards. So if we want to localize our seventh nerve in the internal artery canal, if we look down the barrel of that canal, we'll see it's divided anterior and superiorly by the falciform crest. We can see that there is a little dot here, and that dot is your seventh nerve along the horizontal tympanic portion. Now, we're going to prefer, if we go out drinking, to have seven up over coke, meaning my seventh nerve is going to be anterior superior over my cochlear nerve, and behind them are the components of the eighth nerve, the superior and inferior vestibular cochlear nerves. It looks like a little man driving the car in the coronal plane, and that steering wheel is going to be your seventh nerve. You can see that the stapes footplate is coming up and pressing on that oval window on your gas, and your horizontal semicircular canal forms the dashboard. So easy relationship, nicely seen in a coronal CT scan looking for your facial nerve.
If we follow that nerve, it then exits down from the posterior genu, again that bend, and it exits out the style of mastered foramen. So let's look in detail at the nerves inside that internal otter canal and cisternal segments. So if we look at the falciform crest, that divides the anterior and superior portions of your internal otter canal. If we all go out drinking after learning about this lecture, we'll go to Bill's Bar, and that's really the name of this little bar. It's called Bill's Bar, which divides that um, front from the back, so my seventh nerve, from the superior vestibular cochlear nerve. If you look at, you're gonna remember seven up, anterior superior over coke, and notice that that seventh nerve and seven up can has a little dot. Remind you there's a cherry that there's a fifth little nerve called the sensory nervous intermedius that is also present. So if I look on an axial high-res T2, I can see that additional tiny sensory nervous intermedius branch. If I look down the barrel of my internal otter canal using a high-res T2 MRI, I can see these five key neural components. So I'll see my seventh nerve, the large motor component, and this small little nervous sensory intermedius. I find my cochlear nerve, anterior inferior, and then behind them, I have my superior and inferior vestibular cochlear nerves. Now, you can look for these nerves, and it's important to remember that most schwannomas arise from sensory nerves. So we can see here where the arrow, if you have your eighth nerve, that if you have a eighth nerve schwannoma, it's going to arise from scarpa's ganglion inside the internal canal, and it looks like ice cream filling a cone and then spilling over. So it will widen the porous acousticus, or the opening of my IEC, and it comes along usually the vestibular or inferior vestibular cochlear nerve. So they're really a vestibular schwannoma. If we see the seventh nerve, it looks more like ice cream sitting on top of a glass, and we'll come back to that a little later. If we now look at the openings that extend from the seventh nerve, importantly, the seventh nerve has contributions to the vidian nerve. In the old literature, it was also called the pterygoid, or this opening was called the pterygoid canal. Now, how do we find this? This is a coronal CT scan, and this is an axial CT scan. On the CT scan, we see this one hole here. That is going to be your foramen rotundum, and inferior and medial is vidian, so RV. Think of an RV. This is your vidian canal, which contains the vidian nerve. Now, it's found at the base of the pterygoid plates. It's medial and inferior to foramen rotundum, and it's importantly going to connect this important space called the pterygopalatine fossa, along with nerves that go back to the foramen serum, and also that greater superficial petrosal nerve, which is a continuation of that nervous intermedius back to the temporal bone. So if we look for that, we can see this is my vidian canal, this is my foramen ovale, and this is my foramen spinosum. And we can see that relationship nicely. So here is my vidian canal, and here is the vidian canal in the axial plane on this CT scan. Now the vidian nerve is a combination of two key nerves. And we'll go through that again. The first key nerve is that greater superficial petrosal nerve, which we'll call the GSPN. Now that is a continuation of your nervous intermedius. So the fibers of that nervous intermedius go right through this genu, this little orange dot, and continue on as the GSPN. Those give parasympathetic fibers. They pick up sympathetic fibers from the deep petrosal nerve, which comes off my carotid plexus. And together, those form this vidian nerve which runs to my pterygopalatine fossa. So if we look on an axial T1 MRI, I call it the Starbucks of the head and neck because you can see it as a nice little round dot surrounded by fat. It's also a good place where my vidian nerve hooks up and meets up with branches of my V2 trigeminal nerve. So let's walk through that again. My seventh nerve gives us that parasympathetics GSPN. That's going to hook up with my sympathetics which are gonna come from my deep petrosal nerve. Now my GSPN is gonna synapse and help innervate all that glandular tissue, including my lacrimal nerves, my orbits, nasal, and palatine glands. My sympathetics come from that internal carotid plexus, that deep petrosal nerve, which hook up with my GSPN, forming the vidian nerve. My afferent sensory branch is from V2, which is coming back and also goes into the ganglion, and that also innervates the sensory components of my midface involving the orbits and posterior and nasal regions, as well as along the nasopalatine and pharynx regions in the midface. So if we look at the seventh nerve again, we're going to look for it anterior and superior, and we see as it goes back to that posterior genu, it then dives down in this coronal CT scan and on this axial CT in the stylomastered foramen. 
We can follow that seventh nerve as we look in this schematic and look in this axial CT of the temporal bone. So the first space here, which is kind of lateral, is called the facial nerve recess. Easy way to remember it, it's more lateral, it's more shallow, it has an L, and that's facial has an L, so your lateral shallow recess is your facial recess. Then you have your little pyramidal eminence, and medial to that, you have your sinus tympani. If we follow my seventh nerve as it goes down that stylomastered foramen, which is pointed to here by this red arrow, notice there's a tiny little hole anteriorly. That is the opening for the corda tympani nerve. So after my facial nerve dives down, the corda tympani nerve comes back up, it goes through my ossicles, as we see here, and then it exits out the petrotympanic fissure and joins the lingual branch of V3. After that comes through, the mandibular nerve comes through foramen ovale, and they run down together. So if we look for that corda tympani nerve, it runs up and through and then out. So let's follow our nerve now, the facial nerve, which is seen here in yellow, as it goes through the temporal bone in the coronal plane. So we get a better sense of where it lives and where it goes. So if we now follow my nerve, notice that first comes anteriorly to form this genu, which means bend. And then it has a ganglion here. That's called the geniculate ganglion. So it's kind of a little large. And the nerve kind of comes forward and then swings back. After we follow that nerve back, you can see here's a labyrinthine segment. It comes forward, and then it starts moving backwards to that horizontal tympanic component. So it's my little steering wheel under the dash, seen here in the coronal plane as like a little dot, and it runs underneath my horizontal sunbaker canal. So here's my horizontal sunbaker canal, here's my steering wheel, here we have my little stapes foot plate pressing on the oval window gas. So you can see your seventh nerve, you want to make certain it's either got a little bony covering, and it's not out there freely hanging in the eye into the middle ear because if you have a surgeon who's putting a cochlear implant, you don't want him to damage the seventh nerve. And it can sometimes be foreshortened or anteriorly kind of hanging out in certain syndromic syndromes. If the um, patient is having a cochlear implant, you want to look for that ahead of time to make certain that it's safe and won't be damaged by the surgeon. Now if I look at cranial nerve 7 and 8, they're intimately related. So if we now look in the axial CT as we see here and coronal CT scan, let's take a look. Here is my cochlea, which is going to be innervated by my cochlear nerve, and here's my seventh nerve, which is located superiorly. Notice my cochlear nerve is located inferiorly. If we look in the IAC, we see seven up, seven is anterior superior, and my cochlear nerve is anterior inferior. If I look at my seventh nerve on a post-contrast MRI, it's normal to have enhancement anything distal to my genica ganglion, meaning anything going like beyond that. So the genica ganglion going to horizontal tympanic down to that descending portion, enhancement can normally be seen. It's not normal to see abnormal enhancement going proximally or going into the um, labyrinthine segment or into the IAC. Now on a high res MRI, you might see faint, faint enhancement because all nerves have little vessels with them, but it shouldn't be pathologically enlarged or abnormally enhancing. That usually implies some sort of pathology. So if we look on a T2 MRI, we can see the CSF is bright. We can see our nerve segments, and you need to be looking for things that might be touching the nerve, especially after it exits the brainstem, and where the myelin transitions from central nervous system myelin to peripheral nervous system myelin. That's called the root entry zone. And it's seen on all cranial nerves, usually a few millimeters after they exit from their origin. So here we can see there's a tortuous vessel. It's compressing near that root entry zone. If it's compressing on the seventh nerve, which controls muscles of facial expression, it can cause a facial hemispasm. If you lift the vessel off it by interventional procedure, that might stop. If the nerve sits down and compresses the um, if the vessel compresses the nerve again, it might occur again. So it's important to make sure that the nerves as they exit out are also not being compressed or distorted by any sort of vessels. So what if you have pathology along the nerves? Well, arising from nerves, if you have a tumor from the Schwann cells, you have a Schwannoma. Anytime you put oma onto that tissue, you create a tumor. If I have a tumor rising from glial cells, I'll have a glioma. If I have a tumor rising from my sarcomeres and my muscles, it's a sarcoma. So if I have a tumor arising from the Schwann cells of my seventh nerve, I have a facial Schwannoma. So if we look here on these T2 images, we can see the normal, where I can see the CSF. And on here, we can see there's a mass inside the cerebellopontine angle cistern.
So we can see this mass is obstructing the opening of the IAC, and we can see this the fluid in here is a little bit grayer because it is proteinaceous material and it's not as bright as the normal fluid within the remaining cistern or in the fourth ventricle. And here's my normal side for comparison, showing my cranial nerves, here's my cochlea, and here's the vestibule. So this is a facial schwannoma, which is arising from the Schwann cells of my seventh nerve. And I like to describe this as ice cream kind of sitting on top of the glass, not really filling the whole cone, but just kind of sits on top of it. And that's important because you want to make certain you don't miss a facial schwannoma versus a vestibular schwannoma. So these are cases of facial schwannomas. They kind of sit on top of it without really filling the IAC or widening it. And it's like ice cream sitting on top of the glass, but not really filling the glass, which is down below it. So you want to make certain you identify any nerve that has a schwannoma, but importantly, you don't want your surgeons operating on a facial schwannoma because it can lead to facial paralysis. Now, 70% of the time, if a patient has a facial schwannoma, they will present with symptoms. Their facial nerve won't be working as well. They may not be able to move the muscles of their face, and they'll have other involvement. But 30% of the time, these patients may not present with any symptoms, so you need to be carefully assessing, like, could this maybe be a fake out and be a facial schwannoma as opposed to a true vestibular schwannoma? And we'll show those to you next. So now we look at our seventh nerve as it exits out and notice mother nature protects it by that mastoid tip because it's a very important nerve. And then it will branch into five key branches within the parotid gland. Now this patient, notice you see the nice normal fat on this axial T1 post GAD fat saturated image on this contralateral right side. Notice on the left side, there's some abnormal enhancement, and this was a squamous cell carcinoma. So initially in 1.5, everything looks normal, but this patient had difficulty moving the left side of his face. So we knew that there probably is some pathology involving the facial nerves within that parotid gland. And in fact, when he was brought back on a three Tesla, we can see that there's abnormal pathologic enhancement, which was perineural tumoral involvement along that seventh nerve, which can be detected if you're using the right sequences and you should be looking for it if this patient has any sort of tumor in that pre-auricular region. So now we're gonna to move to cranial nerve eight. And if you're in New York, you're going to Broadway, you're here some great shows. So let's see how cranial nerve eight works. Obviously sound comes in, it's transmitted through the ossicles, and then it goes to that little stapes foot plate, which then transmits that sound inward. So here's a schematic showing our ossicles and our cochlea. And we can see if we look in the coronal plane, we can identify that little stapes foot plate, which is coming up and going to my oval window pressing on the gas, so allowing that sound to be transmitted. So here's my facial nerve underneath my horizontal semicircuit canal, and now I can identify my horizontal semicircuit canal, superior and oval window, and here's my cochlea. Now we can see little stapes kind of pressing up on that oval window. If I do a high-res comb beam study, I can really see that nicely. So here's a beautiful example. We can literally see the stapes coming right up into that oval window. We can oblique it, and now we can see both the oval window and the round window, which allows the sound wave to dissipate in both planes. And here are some other images showing high-res where I can see the anterior and posterior crew of the stapes coming right into my oval window in multiple angles with a beautiful uh, delineation of the actual stapes footplate. So now let's look in this axial temporal bone CT. And here's, again, we can see a couple of key structures. I can see my malleus, I can see my incus, and here's my stapes, looks like a little wishbone. Here's my tensor tympani, and this is my cochlea. And this little opening called the singular canal is what allows my uh, vestibular cochlear nerves to come innervate into the vestibule for my balance and you know maintaining localization in space. So you can see here's my cochlea again, and here's that important singular canal, which allows those um, divisions of the eighth nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerves, to come innervating into the vestibule. So here's my malleus, here's my tensor tympani, and here's the stapes seen nicely heading toward that oval window. And now this little junction here is the incostapedial joint, and we need to make certain that's intact, and we can see the long incus, long process, and there's a little tiny lenticular process where they connect right in through here. So here's a schematic showing this anatomy in the coronal plane, and we can see the malleus head, we can see the stapes, and we can see the incus. 
that they kind of all kind of line up together. And here's my tensor tympani muscle. So if I look into the cochlea, let's go into depth how it works here. So let's slice open a piece of the cochlea and take a look inside. As we go inside of the cochlea, if we look inside, we can see that it has a several compartments. You've got a scala vestibuli, which contains perilymph, PL. You have a scala tympani, also containing perilymph, noted here in PL. And then you have this cochlear duct, which contains endolymph. And notice as the sound wave comes in, it pushes onto this area, which is your basilar membrane, and it also pushes this tectorial membrane. And as that moves, it's going to move these little hair cells. So if we look in depth inside even more, we can see that these little hair cells here are affected by the sound wave. So when the sound wave comes, it moves the little hair cells, and that's going to generate an electrical impulse so I can generate sound. So here's my tectorial membrane, here's my little hair cells, the sound wave comes in, it moves them, and as they're moving, here we see my basal membrane, that motion is going to help generate a neural impulse that's taken through your ears into multiple little hair cells. These are then brought back and laid out into the cochlea. So I can see my cochlea, that all comes together, and if I take those neurons, which are in that spiral little ganglia Rosenthal canals, they all come together and to first order neurons and snaps in my dorsal and ventral cochlear nuclei. These then go to second order neurons, which go ipsy and contralateral to the superior olivary complex in the midbrain. And then these pass upwards along the medial geniculate body and then synapse in the lateral lemnisci along my inferior colliculi. And then they, um, between the nuclei, then they then decussate into the pathway to my auditory cortex and temporal lobe so I can hear. So it's important because they literally help you hear sound and you can hear this talk. Now in the coronal oblique plane, I can lay out my semicircular canals and it looks like a snail. So I can lay these out to make sure they have intact bony margins, my horizontal, my superior, and my posterior. And here we can see my facial nerve going down that posterior genu and exiting down the style of mastered foramen. Here I can see my horizontal and my superior semicircular canals, and notice they have nice bony margins. When I oblique it like this, I can lay out this and I can see the cochlea. It looks like a little bit of a snail. So I can identify my semicircular canals and my cochlea, and I can see the anatomy of my intralogic canal here with my divisions in my cochlear and obviously my vestibular cochlear nerves. So moving backwards in the coronal plane, I can see my facial nerve, marked here by FN, and I can see my horizontal, my superior semicircular canal, and this is my internal auditory canal, and I start to see a little bit of my cochlea. As I move backwards now, we can see that round window allowing the sound to dissipate, and if we lay this out, as I said before, it looks like a nice snail in the oblique plane, so I can identify the bony margins and nicely see this posterior genu and stylomastered foramen for my facial nerve. So in my coronal plane, looking at my superior semicircular canals, notice my superior creates a little bump on the floor, middle corneal fossa called the arcuate eminence. Here's my horizontal semicircular canal, and we can follow my round window, and we can identify this anatomy quite nicely. Moving backwards, I see my stylomastered foramen, which is where my seventh nerve exits from. As we move backwards again, we see that stylomastered foramen, and here I can identify my vestibule, and I can see that little singular canal right below it, allowing my vestibular cochlear nerves to come in and innervate. Now the vestibule is located along that medial wall. It has a little elliptical recess, posterior and superiorly, and this is the utricle. So I can see my utricle, this is my saccule. So let's take a look in this anatomy a little more detail. So that anterior inferior is my saccule, and now I can see that as I look at my semicircular canals, they come into this area. So now the this connects my saccule to the cochlea via the ductus reunions right in here. And as we follow this anatomy, we can see there are five openings. So even though I have three semicircular canals, notice that two of them, the superior semicircular canal and the posterior, basically share a common crus. So there's only five openings because two of them are sharing one of them. Now, if I look at my inner ear, we can see these two membranous sacs, the utricle and the saccule. And this is what helps you maintain balance. So we can see the utricle is larger, lies lateral, and it connects to that semi, that connects the semicircular canal ducts via those five ampulla and to the saccule 
and we can see these right here. So now we've laid this anatomy out. So you can see the cochlea, you can see the saccule, the utricle, and the superior canal, along with the vestibular aqueduct laid out on the schematic for you. So if we identify inside and go inside to the utricle in a little more detail, we can see that inside the utricle, you have these little cilia hair cells, they have gelatinous membranes, and they contain little granular otoliths. It's just a fancy term for saying a little stone, so otoliths. And these little things move around, and that helps localize where you are in space. Now, the saccule and it has the macula, and rounder is more medial, connecting to that cochlear duct and utricle. And if we look inside there, it also contains these little um, copulas and endolymph, and when you rotate your head, kind of tells you where you are in space. So those vestibular nerves are very important for kind of balance and how we know where we're locating ourselves in location. So they are also important because this is where vestibular schwannomas arise from. So here on this normal, and here's our comparison, we can see there's big masses arising from my vestibular nerves, widening that internal auditory canal, widening that internal canal, and they're filling into the cerebral pontine angle cisterns. So I see bilateral, large vestibular schwannomas. And notice they're so big, they're pushing along the brachial pontus and are facing my fourth ventricle. And in fact, when I see bilateral vestibular schwannomas, I'm thinking NF type 2, which is seen on chromosome 22. Easy way to remember that. So these are classic bilateral vestibular schwannomas associated with NF type 2. The way to think about these are ice cream that completely fill the cone and is basically bursting that cone open and both the cone and the ice cream are all edible and classic parents. Now, if you're really sharp eyes, you can get schwannomas on other nerves. As we see here, there's one arising from the hypoglossal nerve hiding underneath here. So there's a lot of schwannomas associated usually with NF type 2 for NF 22. So that's known also as MISMI, seen with multiple enhancing schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas. So we're going to move from the eighth nerve now to the ninth nerve, or the glossopharyngeal nerve. So this nerve has key functions for both the tongue, which stands for glosso, and the pharynx, pharyngeal. So we can see that you've got your carotid tympanic nerve, and we can see the facial nerve, which gives off that chorda tympani coming here. And there's a key branch here now of the glossopharyngeal nerve with the lesser petrosal nerve, which also runs back into this area. So let's follow my ninth nerve, my glossopharyngeal nerve, as it exits and come out the brainstem. Now it exits via the jugular foramina, and it exits via the smaller pars nervosa. So let's think about ninth nerve. It has a lot of functions. So the ninth nerve is involved with several key functions. Let's take a look at this. If we look at the ninth nerve, we see it's involved with general and visceral and special sensory and branchial and motor, branchial and visceral motor. So I've got multiple functions of my ninth nerve. So let's take a look at all of these. Here's the course and schematic of my ninth nerve. And we can see that it arises from the most rostral set of rootlets between the olive and my inferior cervical peduncle. It comes right out from the posterior olivary sulcus, as we see here. And then in the jugular fossa, it gives off a little tympanic nerve before the main trunk exits via the jugular foramen. And that's where this little arrow is pointing to that little tympanic nerve. We can see that the jugular foramen has pars nervosa and it has super and inferior glossopharyngeal ganglia. And these are special nerve cell bodies that mediate general, visceral, and special sensation. And these special cells um, can also give rise to glomus tumors. So let's take a look at this in an axial plane. So in the medulla, we're going to look at it as the most rostral set of rootlets, and it's located between the olive and the inferior cervical peduncle. So this is your olive. So put two little olives here so you can find it. And it comes right behind it in the posterior lateral olivary sulcus. So here's my ninth nerve. If I look on an axial T2 MRI, I can find the ninth nerve right behind my olive, exiting as the most rostral set of little rootlets along that posterior olivary sulcus. I can actually look on a high-res T2, and here's a sagittal reconstruction, and I can find my ninth nerve at the very top here, exiting out. Now, these rootlets converge and form cranial nerve 9. As we follow cranial nerve 9, we can see that it gives off that tympanic nerve, which comes off before the nerve exits into that pars nervosa of the jugular foramina. So that tympanic nerve leaves via the inferior ganglion, ascends via the inferior tympanic canaliculus, 
and it runs right over that cochlear promontory, which is why I can get a little glomus tumor here from that little branch of the ninth nerve sitting right on the cochlear promontory. So this is my cochlea. This bony protuberance here is the promontory, and I can get a little glomus tumor that rises right in here from that ninth nerve. Now this is an axial T1 post-contrast MRI, which has very nice delineation of all the nerves in this area, and we can see them as linear areas of non-enhancement. Now the jugular foramina, and this one is very high riding, you've got a large pars vascularis, which is a big one, it has a smaller pars nervosa. So if I look on my axial schematic and this picture, the jugular foramina has a lot of key ganglia, which, as I said before, do a lot of things, innovating general, visceral, and special sensation, and let's take a look in more detail. So if we follow my ninth nerve, here's my ninth nerve exiting into the pars nervosa, it comes around and has near the carotid nerve, it joins inferior ganglia and also innervates the posterior tongue as well as pharyngeal branches. So the branchial motor, it gives special visceral reference to the stylopharyngeus muscle. It also originates here in the nucleus ambiguous. So I can follow my branchial motor, innervating, here's my stylopharyngeus muscle. It also has key innervation with visceral fibers, which come back up and form the lesser petrosal nerve. Now this is a crazy nerve because it comes back up through the middle corneal fossa and then goes through foramen valley and then synapses inside my otic ganglion. So it has parasympathetic origins from the inferior salivatory nuclei. It also has visceral motor with that tympanic nerve we see here leaving the inferior ganglion, goes over that tympanic canaliculus and it forms a plexus, as we said before, over the cochlear promontory. And that gives sensation to the inside of the ear here, to the external entry canal, your tympanic membrane, your station tube, and the mastoid. This travels back to the cranium via the lateral GSPN. So now if we take a look here, let's follow this course. We see that this nerve comes back up, goes over the cochlear promontory, then comes back up, and then also exits out foramen ovale. So it goes forward, it descends via foramen ovale, and then synapses into my otic ganglion. Now in the otic ganglion, it's also surrounded by the nerves that go to the medial pterygoid muscle, V3. And it helps give post uh, parasympathetic postganglionic fibers to the parotid gland. Now associated with this is a really important little nerve, which kind of hooks up all these nerves in this region. And that is a little branch called the auriculotemporal nerve. And it's a small little branch of V3, and this has preganglionic parasympathetic roots, which are fibers from nine, and that forms the lesser petrosal nerve in the otic ganglion. But it also has a little somatosensory root, and this auriculotemporal nerve, which I want to talk about, originates from V3. Now this nerve takes a kind of funny course. It follows along the superficial temporal artery along the scalp, but as it comes back, those fibers are going to somatosensory fibers of V3 are going to pass through that important otic ganglion, another key connection. So let's look in more detail at this auriculotemporal nerve. So that otic ganglion is below foramen ovale, and that converges to form a single trunk, kind of anterior the ear, and is joined by those nerves from the external atrium meatus, your skin, the auricle, as well as somatosensory from the TMJ and the tympanic membrane. Now notice this nerve, of course, is deep to the lateral pterygoid, encircles the middle meningeal, and then joins the main trunk of V3. So let's review that again, because the auriculotemporal nerve is a really important nerve. So we know from the otic ganglion, which is kind of below foramen of valley, this is going to converge to a single trunk, anterior to the ear, and is joined by nerves which also innervate that external atrium meatus, the skin, the auricle, my tympanic membrane, and my TMJ. Now this nerve is right here, and it's going to course deep to my lateral pterygoid muscles, it splits here and actually encircles my middle meningeal artery, and then it's going to join the main trunk of V3. It's a very important connection, especially in the parotid gland, between my mandibular division of my trigeminal nerve and cranial nerve 7, as well as branches of 9. So really important nerve splitting between the, uh, around the middle meningeal artery, and then it joins up. Now, if we look for this in the axial plane, we can see it nicely on this axial T1 MRI. So these branches intermingle and join with the facial nerve in the parotid and importantly links those fibers. So here's a normal auricular temporal nerve, and this is an abnormal enlarged 
auricular temporal nerve, which has perineural tumoral involvement along it. So you look for it behind. Here's my mandible. I'm going to look for it deep to the mandible, and here's my pterygoid muscles. Here's my normal, abnormally enlarged with perineural spread. So important to identify this nerve, especially in cases of head and neck cancer along the parotid or in the preauricular region. Now, corneal nerve 9 has visceral sensory involving the carotid nerve, which goes down to the inferior ganglion, and that's from the tractus solitarius, and these go to the reticular formation and your hypothalamus. It also importantly has carotid sinus stretch and baroreceptors, which help monitor your blood pressure, as well as those important carotid body chemoreceptors for O2 tension. So glomus tumors can also arise from these as well. So if we look at that cranial nerve 9 visceral sensory, notice these glomus cells. So if you add a um, oma to anything again, you get a paraganglioma, which can arise from these chemoreceptor cells. And those important with a bare receptor for maintaining your blood pressure. So again, cranial nerve 9, key functions. It has a little general sensory. Okay, this is along the posterior one-third of the tongue, as well as giving sensation from the external ear and the internal tympanic membrane. And of course, you have general and special sensory. So you've got these spigeminal tract, you've got key innervation, which goes along with that. So special sensory, you've got afferent taste along the posterior one-thirds of the tongue, right? We see coming back through here, remember, cordic tympany is the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and nine is posterior. So cranial nerve nine, coming from the jugular foramina here with that special sensory. Now we're going to move to its neighbor, which is cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. Now vagus means like a vagabond, like wandering, and this nerve also has branchial and visceral motor, as well as general and visceral sensory. So just like the 10 subway in New York, this goes all over the place. So this nerve has a lot of running around with a lot of different areas it runs. So it basically innervates throughout the chest and the abdomen and gives off two different important nerves, the recurrent laryngeal nerves, which have a different route, and we'll talk about that coming up. So the 10th nerve, as we can see here, has sensory and motor, right? So you've got parasympathetic fibers from the dorsal vagal nucleus. You've got branchial motor from the nucleus ambiguous. This innervates to the soft palate, pharyng pharyngeal constrictor muscles, your larynx, palatal glossus muscles, and pharynx. And you have visceral motor, and those go throughout the chest, abdomen, pharynx, and larynx. So it has a lot of functions. You've got sensory, you've got the larynx, trachea, esophagus, chest, abdomen, aorta, and you've got general sensory, which also goes to the skin along the posterior region, external optimatus, the tympanic membrane, pharynx, and epiglottis. So 10 has a lot of key functions. If we follow its course, we can see it also emerges from little rootlets, which converge together, and these exit via the jugular foramina, via the larger pars vascularis. So if we think about that, it goes into the larger opening of the jugular foramina, and we can see that it has two sensory ganglia um, along that jugular foramina. If we go into a little more detail, we open it up, we can see that the 10th nerve has a superior and inferior nodosum. Now, these are important for they also mediate that. So let's find our 10th nerve by going back to an MRI. So the vagus has that cisternal segment. It merges the little rootlets, and these are below uh, cranial nerve 9, and below the inferior ganglia, they're joined by fibers from the nucleus ambiguous. So I'm going back to an axial T2 MRI, and here's my olives. Below cranial nerve 9, I'm going to find cranial nerve 10. So now we can see cranial nerve 9 is the most superior, and cranial nerve 10 coming out and going to the larger opening, the pars vascularis of the jugular foramina. So in an axial bone window, I'll have my little smaller uh, pars nervosa and a larger pars vascularis, and that contains 10 and 11 in the larger opening. So it exits via the jugular foramina and the larger pars vascularis, and we follow its course. Now in the jugular fossa, it has a little auricular branch. In the neck, it's going to run with it, my in the neck, giving off the pharyngeal, superior laryngeal, and recurrent laryngeal nerves. And there's a different course for the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right versus the left side, as well as innervation to the heart. In the chest, it has that cardiac component, that recurrent laryngeal nerve as well, and also to the pulmonary and esophageal regions, and of course, throughout the GI tract. So it wanders all over the place like its name. So if we look at the course of the vagus, below the inferior ganglia, those fibers from the nucleus and vigus travel along with cranial nerve 11. And in the neck, this lies between the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery. So we can see my uh, vein, my carotid artery, and then my nerve, we don't see it because it's so tiny, 
but we know it runs in the same space. Now it descends along that carotid sheath and it takes a different route for the recurrent versus the left and right side. So it has branchial motor. These arise from that nucleus ambiguous and that branchial motor is gonna innervate my superior, middle, and inferior constrictor muscles, as well as my levator palatini, my salpopharyngeus, my palatopharyngeus, and my palatoglossus muscles. So on the superior nerve, we'll divide into internal and external branches. Now the external laryngeal nerve is gonna innervate my inferior constrictor muscles, my cricothyroid, my pharyngeal plexus, and also go to my superior cardiac nerve. Now the right recurrent laryngeal nerve hooks under my subclavian and then it's going to ascend back up in that tracheoesophageal groove. Now that's important because it takes a different course on the left side. My left recurrent laryngeal nerve arises from my left vagus nerve and then it hooks posteriorly under the aortic arch and then, then ascends in the tracheoesophageal groove. So if I have an aberrant right subclavian artery, I will have an odd course of my recurrent laryngeal nerve. And they call that a non-recurrent recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is basically saying it has a abnormal course and a surgeon to need to be aware of that. And they're gonna operate in the neck. So anytime you have aberrant vasculature, like a aberrant right subclavian artery, which goes behind the trachea and esophagus, you're gonna have an abnormal course of these nerves as well. So let's look at the innervation here into the larynx, which is really important. So cranial nerve 10 has branchial motor. Now that superior laryngeal nerve branches from that inferior ganglion and divides into external branches, which go to the inferior constrictor muscles and to the cricothyroid muscle outlined here in green. We have branchial motor, which also is going to innervate the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So those are nerves coming up from below. And that innervates the lower half of the larynx and those intrinsic muscles of the larynx. So you have adductors, meaning they come together, your lateral cricoarytenoids, your thyroritinoids, and your intraritinoid, and you have an abductor. And this basically rotates the arytenoid cartilages out, and that's your external cricothyroid muscle. So adductors are gonna pull it together. So here's the action of my lateral cricoarytenoids. So we can see that they pull everything together. We now have my adductors for my thyroritinoids, and these comprise the bulk of the vocal cord. These basically tense the vocal cords, and we can see they pull them together. And you have your adductors from your intraritinoid. So these two little inside ones pull them together and close the glottis. Now we have a single paired external cricothyroid, and this is going to abduct. So when it tilts the thyroid, it basically pulls the cord apart. Abduct means to take away, pulling the cords apart. So when the nerves and muscles all work together, like mine are doing right now, I can form a sound and a waveform and able to make sounds and speak to you and make the sounds that I'm making now. So if we now look at cranial nerve 10, we also have visceral motor. And so you've got these parasympathetic nerve cell bodies along the floor of the fourth ventricle, near the vagal trigone, and these are going to innovate the parasympathetic um, areas throughout the lungs, liver, pancreas, gut, kind of important, and that nucleus ambiguous, which is also parasympathetic to the motor cardiac plexus. Now, you've got innervation of the lungs, heart, esophagus, and the right and left gastric nerves, as well as to the stomach, your intestines, your cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, which is why you get that gut feeling when you've got fight or flight or all the other responses that you have in your gut. So the visceral sensory, same thing. We have sensory fibers in these same regions throughout the heart, lungs, chest, esophagus, epiglottis, importantly along the tongue base and AE folds. So if you're choking, you make sure things aren't going the wrong pipe, your larynx, and as well as the internal laryngeal nerves. So very sensitive, right? You're sensitive to things in there. And these axons go to the medulla, tractus solitarius, and that's also reflex control with the reticular formation and your hypothalamus. Now there's general sensory from 10 as well. So you've got uh, pain, temperature, and touch along the larynx and pharynx, the ear, as well as that tympanic membrane. So that tympanic membrane, as you know, if you have any of a blow in your ear, it's very sensitive. It's got a lot of innervation and, and sensation, so if something's going on there. Your meninges, as well as going to the posterior cranial fossa. You've got general sensation along the vocal cords and the larynx, carried with that visceral fibers of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And of course, general sensation to the larynx above vocal cords carried with the visceral fibers of the internal laryngeal nerve. So let's take a look here on an axial CT scan looking at cranial nerves 9 and 10. So here's a patient who's got a mass, which we can see, which has got 
um, enhancement, and it's splaying and opening up my internal external carotid artery. And here's my vocal cords, just to show this what's going on here. Now, if I have a mass arising from those glomus cells, or I have these special paraganglioma, I might have a glomus tumor, which is now splitting this. So this is a classic carotid body tumor. So this carotid body tumor is splaying my internal external carotid arteries, often has multiple little flow voids, and it's very, very vascular. So when a T2 here, all these little dots are all these flow voids, they enhance like gangbusters, and they are highly vascular tumors. And we can see here they enhance on this post-contrast imaging. If I do a coronal, I again see it's sitting right where I know that those fibers, um, those little key nerve cells are located, those glomus um, receptor cells that we talked about, forming a glomus tumor, which is now splaying my internal extrauded um, arteries, kind of a carotid body tumor sitting kind of the notch right between those two vessels and spreading them apart. Now this is an axial post contrast and this is an MRA. So this nicely shows all my vessels, my arch. I then have my common carotid arteries then I'm coming to my internal and external branches. And notice here where the glomus tumor is, it's splaying these vessels apart, sitting right in between them. So classic appearance for glomus tumor. You always want to double check that there's not another one present. This patient only had one. And you want to look carefully throughout the entire course to make sure there are no other tumors identified. So this patient had a removal of this tumor. So we had this left-sided product get paraganglioma, had it surgically removed, so they did a nice job to get the tumor, but unfortunately, they damaged the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and now we can see that he's got a vocal cord palsy. So the vocal cord now, you can see here, is an ipsilat enlargement of this piriform sinus. It's not a tumor here, but we can see that this kind of sale sign. It deviates in immediately, and you can see that piriform sinus is widened, and you can see that the uh, Cartilage is also displaced, and if we look in the coronal plane, you can see that this laryngeal ventricle, right between my true and my um, false cords right here, right, that space right in between is widened on this side. So this kind of looks like Nefertiti's head, and if you would imagine this is her ear, it looks kind of abnormally enlarged. So when I have a vocal cord palsy, it can happen again. So here's a patient with a thyroid mass right in the course of that recurrent laryngeal nerve affecting it. So now my cord is deviated in. It cannot be pulled out here. So I have a vocal cord paralysis. Muscles innervated here, also a little bit denervation atrophy and like atrophic. And here I can see my laryngeal ventricle on this side is asymmetrically enlarged. And this is a classic vocal cord palsy. Now notice cranial nerve 11 on this patient is also affected because my trapezius and my sternocleidomastoid are also smaller. So that just, just takes us to cranial nerve 11. Pretty straightforward because it's a spinal accessory nerve and it just has motor innervation. Pretty simple, just to my sternocleidomastoid and my trapezius muscles. So the origin is from that nucleus ambiguous and the spinal motor fibers kind of travel along those, um, from those anterior, lateral, lateral anterior horns, C5, C1 through C5, exit the cord lateral, then it comes back up and it exits out that pars vascularis with cranial nerve 10. So the lower motor neurons of the bodies of cranial nerve 11 kind of ascend back up foramen magnum and then they exit that jugular foramen with the pars vascularis along with cranial nerve 10. Remember pars nervosa is for 9, 9 has an N, nervosa has an N, and then your 1011 go in the larger pars vascularis. And this just innervates my sternocleidomastoid and my trapezius muscle. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward for this nerve which takes us to our last one, which is the hypoglossal or somatic motor for innervating your tongue. So this supplies all of my intrinsic tongue muscles except for palatoglossus, which is cranial nerve 10, and let's follow the course of this nerve. So here's the innervation of this nerve. We follow my cranial nerve 12 coming to my tongue muscles. So let's follow the course of this a little bit. So if I try to find the nuclei, I'm now at the base of my fourth ventricle, these two little red dots, and I can see that the Nucleus is located what's called the medullary tegmentum, and we can see these little dots. So if I look for the hypoglossal triangle at the base of the floor of the fourth ventricle, we can see these two little dots. That's my nuclei for my hypoglossal nerve. And then the roots are gonna exit along the ventral lateral sulcus between the olive and medullary pyramids. So these are anterior, and we see these little tiny rootlets coming out. So in the axial plane, we see them exit, 
and then they go through the hypoglossal canal. Now in the coronal plane right here, it looks like two birds kind of facing away from each other. So if you look underneath the bird's beak, you can identify the hypoglossal nerve. So here we can see these little rootlets converge to form the hypoglossal nerve, and they exit. So two little birds facing away from each other. Here's my jugular tubercle, and that is my little pink dot is my cranial nerve 12, my hypoglossal nerve. So this exits and it's located just medial to the cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11, which are exiting from that jugular foramina. So this again supplies all of my intrinsic tongue muscles and three out of the four extrinsic. Remember that polyglossus is innervated by 10. So here's my hypoglossal nerve and we can follow that nerve as it exits and then innervates into the tongue. So let's follow our nerve. So it exits the hypoglossal canal, it goes along the carotid sheath, and it passes lateral to my internal and external carotid artery, then it loops under the artery to this general carotid mastoid, and it runs along the floor of mouth between my hyoglossus and my mylohyoid muscles. So I follow my 12th nerve, kind of running along its course, and again, it runs kind of lateral inferior to the intracarotid artery, internal jugular vein, goes deep to the belly of that posterior belly of the digastric, loops under that anterior greater corner of the hyoid, and then runs along the surface of my hyoglossus muscle. So here's my hyoglossus muscle, and riding along the surface is my 12th nerve. Now above the free edge, it's along that posterior malohyoid, it's gonna supply all the intrinsic tongue muscles, so allowing us to move our tongue and make sounds. And again, three out of the four extrinsic tongue muscles, the genioglossus, styloglossus, and hyoglossus muscles. So that innervation is key. So you've got key motor innervation, all the tongue muscles, as I said before, except palatoglossus. And it also has little C1 and C2 fibers that innervate the superior belly of the omohyoid, geniohyoid, and thyrohyoid muscles. And it has a little sensory innervation, a little bit just to the meninges on the posterior cranial fossa. So what happens if I damage my cranial nerve 12? Well, if I have denervation, meaning that nerve isn't working, your muscles get replaced by fat. So this is an axial T1 MRI. And notice that the fat is bright on T1, and here's the muscle. And because it's fat, it takes up more space, so it actually looks larger on the side, and this is a classic appearance of denervation atrophy. If you see this, you wanna see if something is actually affecting the origin of the nerve root of 12, especially at the skull base. In the coronal plane, notice that it's the muscle, normal on this side, is now replaced by fat, which takes up more space, a classic appearance of denervation atrophy. If I give gadolinium and then I fat sat, notice that the fat is saturated out, and this is all a classic appearance of denervation fatty atrophy. So what can cause that? Well, in this patient, if we look here, we see they had a nasopharyngeal melanoma. They had tumor sitting here. So here's my pars nervosa, pars vasculars, and then medial to that is my hypoglossal canal. So this is the tumor of this patient. Four months later, we can see this tumor has gotten quite large. Here's my hypoglossal canal. Here's my nerve. And this tumor has now hit the nerve, and the patient developed denervation atrophy. I can look in the coronal plane. I look for my two bird's beak kind of facing away. That little pink dot is my hypoglossal nerve. And we can see as the patient comes out, this was tumor hitting my hypoglossal nerve. And that's why the patient developed a denervation atrophy. And here's the course of the nerve normally as it exits that hypoglossal canal. So I'm really glad I had a chance to go over some key major landmarks, looking at that skull base with you, looking at MRIs and CT scans, looking for some key areas so you can follow your cranial nerves. We looked at some key anatomy of those nerves as they exit the skull base, and of course, pathology that can affect those nerves, either tumors if they arise from those Schwann cells, which are schwannomas, or vessels that might compress the nerves, causing some compression changes, or if there's tumors kind of abutting or affecting the nerves alongside of them in the nasopharynx or any other region along the skull base. So we got to follow the course of these key nerves. I thank you very much for your time and attention, and uh, hopefully one day I get to meet you and we can talk about cranial nerves together. Thanks. Bye.